Okay, everybody. So today we are moving on to our next topic point and next unit really for our AP World History, and that is the Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment is going to be something that is going to have impacts that still felt today and the world that we live in today, the government that we live under, it is shaped by the ideas that come from this time period. So the essential questions today is identify, explain the ideas and their impacts of the Enlightenment. So, um, I just kind of gave you a little sneak preview on that. So don't just stop right there and make sure you're keeping watch. Okay. So the alignment is grows out of the um, scientific revolution also grows out of humanism uh, during the Renaissance period. And it would lead to kind of this age of isms, right? Um, liberalism, capitalism, socialism, um, there's a lot to list there. And, and so it really creates this idea of what is, um, you know, how does the world order work? Um, what are people's places in it? Um, and, and there's a lot of other things to go. So there's, it is an intellectual movement um, that does the challenge the legitimacy of the existing institutions that, uh, that existed prior to its, um, you know, arrival. So things like divine right theory will become challenged. Um, ideas of the church become challenged. Um, and it really redefines individualism, freedom, and self-determination in, in so many ways. Um, and it, so it is fair to say the Enlightenment shapes and continues to shape the world that we live in, the modern world, right? So using the... Um, um, language of the curriculum here. So Enlightenment philosophers apply new ways of understanding and empiric uh, empiricist uh, approaches to both the natural world and human relationships. Uh, they also re-examine the role of religion played in the public life and emphasize the importance of reasoning. Um, and philosophers develop new political ideas about individual natural rights and social contract. All right. So, um, and then moving into like the first philosopher. I mean, there's lots of philosophers that are going to come about and we'll talk about some here. Um, but the first one is uh, a guy named Thomas Hobbes, who's a, a Englishman. Um, he wrote Slavathon, uh, which is a, a, it's basically his ideas come from this, this main idea, the idea of the social contract. The social contract is something that is an agreement between the rulers and the ruled. And the rulers uh, are basically their end of this bargain is that they get to have the power to rule over the people as long as that they, um, they, they do it justly and fairly and, you know, do it in a way that the people are okay with. The, the, the role of the, the people who are being ruled is to obey the rulers or obey the government. And, and even though they are, seceding some sort of freedoms and individualism to the government, um, they do so willingly because of the idea that they get something back in return. And in the case of um, Thomas Hobbes, he kind of believed that humans live in this natural state where, you know, they, they, they want to live in a world where it's nasty, brutish, and short. Um, and if in, in the natural state, and like if there were no governments, right? But in order for man to prosper, they must secede some of these, these individual rights and freedoms because what they gain in his idea is this idea of collective security. Um, you know, I secede my right to do whatever I want, um, and so do others. And so it keeps me safer. It gives me more opportunities for prosperity. And so that's something that is, uh, you know, what Thomas Hobbes really emphasizes is his idea of the social contract. And he's not the only one. There's others that are going to do it as too, including John Locke. And John Locke wrote several, um, you know, works that are highly influential, an essay concerning human understanding and the treatises of government, the two treatises of government. Um, he also argues for the social contract. However, his beliefs about the social contract vary a little differently from what Thomas Hobbes says. And however, he is going to, and he believes what the social contract is, is that, um, that people have a right and a responsibility to overthrow or change governments when the government fails to live up to that social contract. And so this is kind of something, if you apply it today, 
um, in the American government and the system that uh, I imagine everyone who's watching this video is living under is that uh, we get to, quote unquote, overthrow our government pretty much every two years with elections. And so if the government isn't doing the things that the majority of the people believe to be right, we have the opportunity to change that government or at least the officials within that government. Um, and we just had an election this year. And so the people um, voted for um, you know new leadership at the, the top of the ticket uh, for, uh, for the executive department, the presidents. And so, you know, that's something that uh, is kind of bound by the social contract when the when the people don't think that the person whose um, people who are ma making decisions in government are doing the right thing. They have an obligation and a right and a duty in the sense, like John Locke would say, um, to to change that government. So um, the other things they believed in was the idea of inalienable rights. Um, the inalienable rights are rights that uh, no man can take away. Um, especially without some sort of due process of law, um, that they are only taken away by God. And the inalienable rights that he discusses is life, liberty, and property. And for those of you who remember eighth grade history and the Declaration of Independence, these are terms that are not unlike it. But instead of life, liberty, and property, as Thomas Jefferson, or as John Locke said, Thomas Jefferson, who takes these ideas and he kind of turns it into life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, which kind of men, means the same thing, but um, Thomas Jefferson didn't want to be completely a plagiarizer of, of John Locke's works. But the, the Declaration of Independence and stuff, as we'll talk about later, is highly influenced by the environment ideas, um, as well as the American government that does eventually come about um, after the American Revolution. Um, he also had an emphasis that all men are born with like this blank slate of their minds and such. In other ways, they're all men are created equal. Um, and then it is basically the individual's achievement is determined by the environment in which they live and, and then the education that they're allowed to have. Um, and so, yeah, this is something, um, you know, it, it, it shapes who they are, you know, as a person and then John Locke's mind. Um, it, it goes, it's very radical comparatively to like the time period where many people believe that it was your kind of lineage, your, your bloodline, you know, the, the, go back to the idea of the divine theory, you know, we were born into these roles, um, that God chose you to be this roles. And he kind of rejects that idea as it's more about opportunities, um, and the environment in which you live in. So as time goes on, there are going to be more philosophers, uh, especially during the 18th century. Um, and they're going to take some of these ideas and expand on these ideas more so um, and to think critically about uh, what, um, you know, new levels of like so uh, how we think of ourselves socially and politically and economically organized. So we're, there's a lot of philosophers that we can talk about. We're going to focus on a few important ones. Uh, one are the, uh, some are the French philosophers, and there's uh, Montesquieu, Voltaire, and Rousseau. Um, Baron Montesquieu uh, wrote The Spirit of Laws and promotes this idea of a limited government. You know, Montesquieu spent some time living in England. And he becomes admirable of the system that England came up with, with this idea of limited government, where they have a parliament and um, they work in conjunction with the, the king or queen. And he is admirable of this because the idea was that you separate the powers, it makes your government more efficient, and then also um, makes it possible to where not one person can essentially ruin the government. And so when we we're in France, where you had absolutism, where the guy, the king pretty much ruled all, um, he was very much in favor of this idea of separation of powers. Um, it's something that will be adopted by the American system when the Americans um, declare independence and eventually create uh, their new government under the Constitution in 1789. Uh, Voltaire um, wrote a uh, candid um, and it, he promoted the idea of religious liberty and tolerance, um, something that is also going to be pretty influential in the world that we live in today. And so, you know, especially in an era where, you know, the Protestant Reformation had created so much um, 
discourse and within the, the European continents and such, you know, having the idea of like, you know, that a government should promote religious tolerance and, and that people should be allowed to have different religious beliefs without fear of life and, and liberty. And so he is definitely something to promote someone who promotes that. And so most governments in the world today um, do have this general sense of religious tolerance embedded into their, um, into their government's laws. Um, so that, that has huge implications too. Um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, he is a French writer who wrote on education, um, and he expands on the social contract more so, but he kind of adds that the idea that um, the social contract is decided by the general will of the people. And so when he's kind of referring to the general will of the people, um, he's talking about the majority rule. So whoever the sovereign is, the king or a government established by a constitution, um, whoever the government is, they should rule on the idea of the majority rule, um, that they, they should do what the general will of the people is. Okay, so um, there is going to be, um, let me move myself here, um, a... Uh, a lot of other different philosophies that come around during this time. One other important one that has pretty big influences because it, it has influences on a lot of world leaders that come to power during this time is deism. And it's a popular philosophy um, during this time. And the basic idea is that it, it rejects theism where theism believes that God um, is in existence, uh, you know, in every aspect of our life, you know, um, the things that happen to us is because God is essentially putting the path in front of us or something uh, along those lines. Um, and so they, they believe that God intervenes in pretty much everything at any time that he or she, or, you know, God determines. Okay. Deists believe uh, that um, that God is existed um, at least, uh, and there was a supreme being, and he is, or she established this universe, and um, and he created these laws uh, that that determine how the universe functions, and so after that, you know. God doesn't intervene at all in human affairs. He he sets up these laws, and then the universe is 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 runs as like clockwork. Um, and so this idea is going to be um, used by a lot of these philosophers um, and scientists, especially that believe that it is science is the 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 way to be able to understand the laws of the universe. And so you know, talking about. Um, like the law of gravity, it's consistent. It's it's something that I mean, scientists have used the law of gravity for a very long time, um, since you know Isaac Newton had basically not discovered it, but you know wrote about it, and and so like that idea. I mean, and and the laws of motion that Isaac Newton uh, talks about in his works um, are are basically. You know our discovery of what God has has determined as the laws of the universe. Um, so, despite the fact that deists believe that they're they're very different from theists, but deists believe that um, you know God had already set this up, and and there's questions whether he's still around. Um, but um, they do believe that uh, it is important to, in turn, to, to continue to attend church for social obligations and then also for moral guidance. Um, so oftentimes deists are, um, how do I put this? Um, they are mischaracterized as atheists, uh, but they are still, they'd still believe in God, but they just don't believe that God intervenes in everyday life like theists do typically. All right. Uh, um, here's some just quotes. Uh, I, I'm just going to leave it on the PowerPoint for you guys to read over them. Um, but yeah, these are um, just some quotes that uh, are put together by Freemanpedia about from some of the works of the uh, philosophers of the Enlightenment period. Okay. 
So the rise of the Enlightenment through that question established traditions of all areas of life often preceded revolutions and rebellions against existing governments, something that we will talk about more so in topic 5.2, especially with the Atlantic revolutions themselves. And then nationalism became a major force shaping the historical development of states and empires. And so something else we'll also talk about in topic 5.2 is the rise of nationalism, the idea of what defines a people and if those people should have self-determination so that they don't need to be ruled by an empire that is many, many miles away. Um, The Enlightenment ideas and religious ideals uh, influenced various reform movements. These reform movements contributed to the expansion of rights as seen in expanded suffrage, the abolition of slavery, and the end of serfdom. Okay, so the expanded uh, suffrage, and when I say suffrage, I'm meaning the right to vote. So people having more right to determine what are the decisions of their government, the abolition, the getting rid of slavery, and the end of serfdom, something that had been around since the Middle Ages, um, you know, the Enlightenment and their ideas helped push these reform movements for people to um, to get rid of these existing institutions. Um, you know, one of the big concepts is that all men are created equal. And if all men are created equal, then why? And it, that brings up questions of why should one be owned as property? Um, And then why one is considered less so just by their birth, uh, where they know this level of society they've been born in. Um, You know, if all men are created equal, then why do some have the right to vote and some don't? So these are these are things that are going to be challenged during the Enlightenment as well. And so they will come up more so as we get through um, this curriculum that, uh, you know, these movements are going to be influenced by the philosophies um of the enlightenment period and one of them is 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 the demands for women's suffrage and and the movements that come with this um there's going to be uh, an emergence uh, of the feminism that challenges the political and gender hierarchies you know for the longest time women have been living under this patriarchal rule um having less you know rights and societies and and that is something that uh, is going to be challenged uh, using the ideas of enlightenment to to justify that challenge and so some examples i start with mary wollstonecroft's um the vindic- vindication of the rights of women okay so this is going to be a work that's published in 1792 so we're kind of In this point of history where some of the revolutions are occurring uh, both in the United States and to a lesser extent into the in France as well. Um, But her works are considered the trailblazer for the works of feminism and feminism ultimately just is uh, uh, promoting the idea of equality between the sexes. Um, And so she's arguing that the education system at the time was deliberately established to try to keep women um, from being not as capable as men. And it does make sense because if you do read some like how to educate women books of this era, um, they generally are, um, you know, teaching them things about how to be proper um, and and do things that... uh, you know, fulfill social roles, what they believe women should have, which is basically, um, you know, taking care of the home front. Um, and, and while men were going off and getting, you know, education, liberal educations and other things. Um, they also, so she also suggested that uh, there should be uh, a different status for women in society as well. Um, she's kind of pushing for radical reforms, um, and women to have more political rights, um, and that is something that is going to play a huge role in influencing future generations of, of women who are going to fight for, um, you know, things like property rights and, uh, you know, the right to education, uh, the right to divorce. You know, it's, you know it's, a, it's something that, you know, wasn't really available. The only person who could initiate a divorce uh, during these days, which was a, still a major taboo at the time, divorce was definitely frowned upon, um, were, was men. And so, yeah. Um, 
they are going she's going to influence future reformers like um elizabeth k standard uh oh, excuse me margaret fuller all right Olympe de gorgeous um i'm not good at pronouncing french um but anyway <clears throat> the declaration of the rights of women and the female citizens okay um so freeman pedia Ben Freeman has, has done a video on her, and so I highly encourage you all to watch it at some point. Um, but she's a French woman, and so she is going to model her works after the Declaration of the Rights of Men and of the Citizen. Um, that is, and, and since we haven't got to it yet, is going to be um, essentially the Declaration of Independence of the French Revolution. Uh, and, and that's just, it's the equivalent. It basically establishes what are the rights of the citizen uh, of the French of France. Okay, but uh, in it, uh, it generally does not give the same status of of rights to women, and so she takes that piece of that work and she inserts women into to it as well, and so it states that women and their male counterparts, they have, both have inalienable rights, um, the, those sacred rights that only God can take away. Um, and then it outlines a bunch of other things um, amongst the ideas that it, you know, women should have the right to participate in government, to be able to voice their opinions, to vote, um, to have property rights, to have, um, you know, the right to choose who they're they marry and things along those lines so you know yeah this is like radical ideas of this day and age it doesn't seem so like in the world we live in but um she was a pioneer as far as forward thinking about what women's rights were and then another one is, the last of these examples is seneca falls conference uh, in 1848 and this is going to happen in america um, it's organized by women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott. Um, the conference itself is going to be the first major movement uh, of the suffrage movement that uh, occurs within the United States. Um, and this is going to establish like what women are going to be fighting for. And um, they are going to um, come up with something known as the Declaration of Sentiments. It essentially asserts that women are equal to men and that they should also have unalienable rights and that they should have the opportunities um, to be able to vote, to participate in representative governments and, and be able to be elected. Um, they should be able to have property rights. Um, and oftentimes in, in, in America during this time, you know, the way that property worked is that uh, – you know, say that uh, she's married um, and has a son, um, but when the, the husband would die, the property would then transfer to the eldest son and bypassing her. Um, they're arguing that she should be able to have that property um, you know, transferred to her and such. So um, those are things. Um, you know, they wanted more rights with marriage um, and the inequality of the divorces and such. They wanted more opportunities in education. They wanted more opportunities for employment. You know, these are all things that uh, they are pushing for and, and really establishes the women's rights movement in the United States. Um, but of course it is inspiring to other countries around the world, England as well. So this is kind of our little Ben Freeman video um, uh, graphic. Um, so it's really short and simple today. And, and a lot of these ideas and things that we're going to talk about with the Enlightenment that we had talked about will come up again and again and again when we get into other parts of this unit. But the Enlightenment, you know, all great revolutions and rebellions start by with ideas. And those ideas uh, are going to come from the Enlightened period. So make sure that you are responding to your um, to the question. Make sure you're using examples from the lecture. Uh, with that being said, this is Mr. Henry signing off. Uh, I hate it when I do it on my Chromebook. <laughs>